when we watch that episode and it's zero in on the map of the United States <laughs> and zero is down yes. to save Marimwood. So. This is my home. Patty and I are not retiring ourselves, but it's just the Mickey Mouse thing. Yeah. My kids who have all, <laughs> all been born since we've been you know, in Marimwood. Six of them have grown up with this tradition have all been part of uh, the decoration. They now have their own homes, and I'm sure we'll see other, whether it be Mickey Mouse Christmas houses or decorated houses right. throughout the Bay Area. So thank you. Uh, I'd like to all thank right. you very much. Thank you. sheet of plywood turn it into a snowman and it's gone downhill ever since. Um, it keeps getting bigger. He never got tired of it. And I, I so many people come up to me because I'm out in front a lot of the time and Don is not available. They come up and they say, oh you did a wonderful job. I love your house and you did, you did. And I say, wait a minute, wait a minute. I just live here. <laughs> uh, and I do, uh, because everything you see in front of that house has been placed by Dom, whether him physically or him asking somebody else to do it. But um, I'm the electrician and the maintenance man. He's the one behind all these things. I'll be somewhat brief, but my first job, as some of you know, was, because uh, there are definitely some old faces I recognize in this room, and that means I'm an older face too, but uh, my first job was uh, working for the community services district in, in the park. So um, this is definitely, you know, home and had been for a long time, and as that said, it did start with a sheet of plywood, and it's grown and grown and grown, and 
You know, my inspiration really came from the, the window at the Emporium, and we just, uh, we just kept evolving it and kept it really traditional, and you know, we're really proud of what we've done, and we've made so many wonderful friends through this, and it's been so great to share, and it was kind of fun to take a, a little last ride around Marinwood right before, uh, right before Christmas and see how much Christmas spirit is really out there versus what you see in other towns and neighborhoods. And it was great to see that everything lit up so much. And I do want to thank my wife, Sandy, my son, Nicholas, and his fiance, Ashley, because um, it really is a family effort. Um, you know, the, the, the help we get for some volunteers is, is awesome. But, uh, you know, when, one of the things I know with the Mises, is the same as us, is a, a lot of times when people are going away on summer vacations, we're home fixing things to make sure that they work for, for holiday time. So uh, our, our summer vacation's kind of a little bit different. So, and for the Bears House, for those of you who don't know, Dad is officially retiring to Gardnerville, Nevada. And so right now, uh, the Bears House is in a 16-foot pod in his driveway. It gets picked up tomorrow, and it will reemerge in Nevada, and those people have no idea what they're in for. <laughs> you, you, would, you would not believe how that 16-foot pod is packed. Uh, it is, it, it, he did a phenomenal job. If there was an award for packing, he'd get it. There's no room for dust. <laughs> so, but we just want to say thank you so much, and we appreciate this, this honor, and, and, it, and it truly is, and we're, we're happy we gave so much to so many generations, so thank you. Thank you, Gordon. We appreciate it very much. Thank you. Thank you. My kids appreciate it very much.
their bills haven't been reconciling out fully, so I've actually got several people in there. Uh, we finally got them to reconcile, but there's still some other back work to do, so I'm expecting probably some adjustments to back bills moving forward, but uh, I actually just gave the last two months of those bills to Carolyn to go ahead and process because we were able to get reconciliation through pg &E. Okay, great, thank you. I had a question on the overtime, the last <clears throat> How much of that 38 is strike? I don't know that I can fully answer that question for you without having the payroll in front of me, Bill, but I would say a large percentage of it is. I mean, they had a team that was out for two full weeks and then another team that went down, uh, unfortunately, just for a day to swap out and then wound up getting uh, released the next day. On the, the minutes, um, item number four, the fifth line down, it talks about uh, the last part of it, done by the architect for site plan reviews. And I think it would be appropriate that the words site and plan and review, not reviews, yeah. be capitalized. That's a real thing. It's right. a process. And maybe we ought to put the word process after it just so it's clear. Or possibly the word application. Something like that. Yeah, because that's what was intended. Mm -hmm. the, the other thing is, as part of the meeting, I brought up two items that aren't in the minutes. And maybe I did it procedurally wrong, but I plan to bring it up under the uh, request for future meeting agenda items. But it, I, don't, I don't care that it didn't get mentioned in the minutes. I'll take care of it later tonight. Okay. Anything else on the consent calendar? I'm on the consent calendar. Oh, I'm so, one more thing. I'm attributed to a sentence at almost the very end of the minutes. Schwartz would like a thank you letter sent to be sent to call. Whoops. Kimberly. Call. Kimberly. Is that what it is? Okay. Yeah. I just. It looks strange out of context. Yes. <laughs> yes, I do. Okay. All right. Um, I, was, I noticed that the play structure at the mini park is finished or fixed, and thank you for having that done finally. Uh, when will the bill, I didn't notice the bill on uh, this month's, um, pa in the packet, when, how much did it cost and when will that bill be in the packet? Um, I believe we used our cow card for that because you have to pay for it in order for them to begin and it was approximately forty five hundred dollars. I'd have to look it up exactly but it's pretty close. Forty five hundred for replacement of parts. To fix that there was a uh, two landings that needed to be fixed and also a post. And that's what it cost. Forty five hundred that work that we can't do? We did the work. That was just in parts. And sh it's six or seven dollars to get it shipped as well. It's heavy. Had to come in the grade. Mm -hmm. So I'm not sure. And we couldn't have bought a different playground set? No, I mean, the manufacturer doesn't even make it anymore. So this is the company that basically makes stuff that's out of stock. So. It's so pretty much just got you a different manufacturer. No, I looked around um, quite a bit. Um, yeah, this is the closest and most uh, price efficient that I could find. Because I saw the leftover pieces hanging out by the maintenance shed, and there's just a little teeny pile of pieces. Yeah, forty-five hundred dollars. Well, yeah, when one of those, when one or two of those beams break, you have to replace the whole thing. So that's why you see the bigger platforms that are installed now. Wow. Okay, thank you. All right, any other comments on the consent calendar? All right, I'll call the question. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Wait, there was no second. Sorry. Okay. I'll second. Thank you. Thank you for that catch. <laughs> um, all right, now we are in public comments. Public comment open time for items not on the agenda. Stephen? Yes. Uh, so last month, um, we uh, there was an announcement of settlement of a lawsuit uh, for the firefighters. They were awarded ten thousand um, dollars. We ended up paying, I think, one hundred fourteen thousand. One hundred two. One 
$102,000 in legal fees. We have a new lawsuit, as expected, from the Millers. Um, and I believe that they are reasonable people. And if there has not been a good faith effort to mediate that dispute, I urge you to watch your pennies and don't necessarily listen to the lawyers who have an economic incentive to carry forth a dispute but try to find if there's a mid-ground that uh, makes sense for the district. I believe it can be achieved, and I sincerely hope that you take the risk uh, that you're placing the district in by engaging in a, uh, with them in a legal action. Thank you. And I'm going to add to that. Um, I was, well, I pretty much figured out just from uh, 20 minutes of Googling over time for firefighters and all the various lawsuits that have been brought against cities and county, or cities and towns and districts um, all over the country, but also here, right here in Marin. And it was quite easily recognizable that the district was going to lose because there were all these lawsuits for the same little pieces of bits and that, of this and bits of that, you know, the uniforms, the classes, the whatever, that were not being added into the calculations properly for the overtime. And I remember standing or sitting in this meeting saying that you're gonna end up paying the firefighters less than 15,000 and you're going to end up spending a whole year on this, and it's going to cost you a hundred grand. And what I don't understand is why the board and the management could not have done the same research that I did. Looked at all the lawsuits, looked at how many of them were lost, and figured out why don't we just settle ASAP. And there were several people in the beginning of the year, February, March, that said, let's settle ASAP. $102,000 is a heck of a lot of taxpayer money to waste. Um, that $102,000 could have gone to the kitchen, the fire, fire department kitchen. It could have gone to the uh, maintenance shed. It probably would have covered redoing the maintenance shed for the park staff. It also could have gone towards paying down some of the unfunded medical, future medical benefits. I mean, that 102000 was a big chunk of money, in my opinion. And I don't understand why you guys went ahead and decided to just fight, 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 spend, spend, spend taxpayer money, because it was very obvious to me and a few other people that you were going to lose. So, the only thing I want to say is whoever was advising you all, you should never listen to again. Gave you a bum rap. Gave you a bum deal. Believe it or not, we're not a litigious crowd. Oh, this is not our diet. It's well, not, it's not our choosing. Both lawsuits. I'm sorry, what are you saying? We both, tried lots, both lawsuits have been brought to the district. We have not initiated the lawsuits. In both cases, we did all we could in our best faith to avoid litigation. In both cases, the district did we all have an that understanding. we could. In so both cases, okay. someone decided to fight. No, actually, no. we we had a settlement. Well, my understanding is we were planning it to settle in January. And then, January. And then actually, year. actually, then labor blindsided us with a lawsuit. We would have never. I mean, we would have settled in a second if we. I mean, that's. I mean, well, I don't want to comment anymore about it. But this Marine Wood was always happy and willing and offered to settle. This was the money. The taxpayer expense came in. Well, I'm not sorry, this is open comment time, and you guys are not even supposed to be in the discussion, so that's fine. <laughs> that's convenient. Well, <laughs> that's what it says. Why well, did you learn the lesson with the Millers? Why are you laughing? Good point. <laughs> <laughs>
That's what it says right here. Mm -hmm. I'm not asked. I mean, the only thing I was asking was who was the attorney or whoever said go for it. No, okay. we, the, Nobody. When, when a lawsuit is filed against the district, no, we had to fight it. Does or that not fight it? We, we, I mean, we immediately settled it. That's what we did. Or settle immediately. But and there was immediately. the way that that settled the. Well, Eric can speak to this more. Okay. We well, in any case, it. if that's what you're saying, you could not settle immediately. You no, had to it was a continue lawsuit. for months and months and months and spend one hundred and two thousand dollars of our money. Okay. Could right. have gone to a lot of different well, places. Absolutely. I would talk to your labor group. No. Um, Thank you. Question. Am I violating the Brown Act by responding now? Yeah, I don't think so. Okay, I won't. We've um, already been. Read the minutes from last time. I'm sorry? Read the minutes from the last meeting, and you will understand that we offered a settlement at the same time the lawsuits were filed. They were ignored. I read the minutes. Great. Read them again. They were quite not enough for me. We offered a settlement almost the same day that the lawsuit In any case, the other thing I really want to say is thank you, Mr. Naylor, for this is the second part of my open comments, very quick. Thank you, Mr. Naylor, for putting out the draft minutes from the ESS committee meeting so quickly. Um, that's, I know it was only a week ago, and you had to get it out within a couple of days. And I appreciated your effort in getting that out so that it could be included in tonight's packet, and I really do appreciate that. But you need to call them draft minutes, not minutes. Thank you. But thank you. All right, so moving on to item E1, district matters. Side letter agreement between Marinewood CSD and Marinewood Professional Firefighters. Yeah, this side letter agreement uh, really just stems from the CalPERS audit that we had last year. This is the last remaining open finding that needs to be resolved. Uh, the side letter agreement really is primarily a change in language. CalPERS decided they didn't like the language as much. They needed things spelled out a little bit more clearly. So that's what this is. Uh, we do already, as I put in the memo, have agreement with the labor group. I have a signed copy of it there. It uh, has to be approved by the board in open session. Uh, which is why it is here at this time. All of these practices are already in place. There isn't an additional fiscal impact by doing this. These are basically legal statutes. Great. Okay. Any, uh, do I have a motion? I move. Second. 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 Uh, I have a question. Can we do uh, comments up here and then open up to questions? Uh, any comments, questions from the board? The financial impact of this? There isn't any at this point. We already practice these things so it's uh, the value of uniforms that your basic employer contributions plus employee contributions holiday pay has no financial impact it's simply a uh, timing, timing issue mm -hmm. because it has to be recognized in the period the holiday incurs and the previous practice was paying out holiday pay twice a year in accordance with the MOU so mm -hmm. now they'll get paid holiday pay in the pay period with the pay period of the holiday falls sounds fair okay thank you um, anybody else it appears you're paying retirement benefits on the uniform allowance and if that's a fact I think that's a horrible thing to do it makes no sense at all it's the law it's pension what do you mean it's the law you got to pay retirement benefits go. on a uniform allowance mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and uh, they don't even actually they're into, the term uniform allowance is a little tricky they don't or, or the employees don't get money to go out and purchase uniforms. The district provides the uniforms to them. It is the value of the uniforms, and it's a, specifically the value of the eligible components of the uniforms. Um, and then it's the annual value of that. It's a statutory item that then gets divided amongst the uh, 26 pay periods in a year, and that exact amount is added every year to, uh, is recognized. We need some new representation in Sacramento. That's well, ridiculous. Well, I don't and disagree I know you with you there in any way, shape, or form. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Any other comments? Stephen? Well, um, yeah, I mean, well, I, uh, I totally concur with Linda that we should have uh, done everything in our power to, to uh, make a break on this uh, 
lawsuit. Uh, I understand how lawyers work. So, Stephen, we're just on okay, the Okay, um, uh, hang on for a second. No, no, we need to stay on topic here. I, we're talking about the MOU. I'm sorry. We're talking about the side letter. We're talking about the, the side, side letter. letter. Yeah, that's what, that's what we're talking about. So, so um, uh, the cost here, the lawsuit, everything brings, slams home the point that we need to outsource our, our fire department. And uh, we can't, we cannot manage this relationship. Thank you. Uh, any other public comments? Call the question. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Uh, item number E2, update Marinwood CSD Emergency Services Succe Succession Committee and the draft minutes. Uh, Jeff, do you want to? Sure. Um, it was a fairly lean meeting this time, um, mostly due to the holidays. I'm not, not a lot of uh, subcommittee meetings were held during this uh, during December. Um, they will pick up substantially the for financial forecast team will uh, be meeting shortly. Um, the chief had supplied some information that he felt was sufficient to start engaging the different entities um, who we will reach out to with regards to um, any talks about mergers or outsourcing or you know, total outsourcing or outsourcing positions and hopefully those meetings will um, start soon. And that is pretty much it. Are there any questions on the, on the meeting? Yes. Yep. Uh, since I wasn't able to attend the last board meeting, um, given that 90% of our calls are medical in nature, I think it might uh, be beneficial to maybe also consider something you know, less um, uh, of an, uh, the mergers is, is a very easy option, but um, we could, well, not uh, an easy alternative, basically. And, um, it comes to mind easily. Easy, yes, thank you. It comes to mind. It's not the execution that is easy, absolutely <coughs> correct. Um, but since our calls are mainly medical, what if we were to um, provide an ambulance service with a paramedic that's uh, a private co company that's employed by us or contracted by us, um, it, it would not be a, a labor group, it would be just a, you know, a, a service. Yeah, a, a service basically. Um, and uh, we would transition into volunteer firefighters um, service or, um, you know, would go under the county. Um, fire service. I mean, my understanding is if somebody calls 911 and the unit is unable to handle a fire situation on their own, then an another units are called to aid. Am I correct? Well, I think it, too bad it, the chief is near, but um, I think Senator Fell sort of has the um, market for paramedic service. Plan area B, I think it's called. Well. What and currently, yes, yeah. but what if we were to just have an, a private contractor provide ambulance service? This is this an agenda item that should be on the meeting. Yeah, no, that's, that's exactly what I'm, where I'm going with this. That I'm, I mean, it has nothing we, to do with the minutes. Could we add this to a potential alternatives that the commission is looking at? It has nothing to do with the minutes. So we, we are having a bit, so actually no, number E2 is update and we're discussing. So we're discussing the ESS meeting first. So but there's a discussion and then a review. So I think this all is fine, I think we're good. Um, I, that seems reasonable to add that in or get feedback. Um, Certainly in terms of operational considerations, there is a subcommittee looking at operational things. We can add that to the discussions um, when I see the chief next, and also the great stills. Yeah, and, and very well may be shut down because it's it's unreasonable for whatever reason. But but that's the, I mean that's the purpose of yeah. what we're doing is sort of throwing everything against the wall. And so I think it's valuable to you know if there's anything that anybody on the board says, hey, mm -hmm. <laughs> stick this after the firing squad. You know. Yeah. Oh. Operational issues were brought several operational issues. 
brought up at the previous meeting, and most of them um, didn't get a tremendous amount of support, just so you're aware. Yeah, no, I, I, got, I got the hints from the next meeting. Any other questions? Um, uh, yeah, I have no problem. Uh, I'm friends on call one of the uh, commission uh, members. I have no problem waiting until the next meeting, but I wanted to address something that happened this meeting because I apologize. I was trying to play catch up. But there was a comment that was made by the chief and by uh, Ms. Green that there was uh, an email that was sent from uh, a member, a chief of a different department that uh, made mention to the, the union or the employee group going behind the doors, going back door and telling them not to communicate with Marilla. Am I, am, I, yeah, am I not off by saying that? Close. Okay. <laughs> well, how's this? The, the email was mentioned. I was wondering if, if that email is, is available to review. Because those were strong words. I don't agree with them. And, uh, as far as I'm concerned, if I don't see the email, I don't believe that I was ever said. I'll talk to the chief about that. Okay. And then get back to you. Great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. I would like to set the record straight on Mr. Naylor's cool. comment on the draft minutes that said Linda made comments pertaining to items on the agenda previously discussed. Now, I have a copy of the agenda from the Emergency Services Succession Committee, and there is absolutely no mention of what I brought up at the committee meeting. I brought up the fact that I thought we should, or I, I wondered if we had all in one place easily accessible itemization of all of the benefits that we currently receive through shared services with San Rafael or through other means of agreements with San Rafael, such as um, the reporting that they allow us to get for free, which uh, the chief said was about $2,000 worth of benefit. The um, the other big one was 35,000. What was the other one? Well, in any case, there were some, some things in the list of benefits that we get that were not in the shared services agreement, as I recall. And it seems that, well, my, my point was we need to gather all this information together in one place because if we do not go with San Rafael, and we go with a different company or, or different fire department or different entity that we need to know what services we are getting and I wanted to know if we knew the value of the services that we were getting from them. And that was not on the agenda and it was Mr. Schwartz who said he thought I was talking out of turn, that I should not be talking about what I was talking about, but I would like you to put on the record that, or at least take off the record, that I was not speaking about items previously discussed from the agenda, because I wasn't. Okay. Thank you. I'm confused now. What minutes are you talking about? Because I didn't attend the meeting you said I commented on. Yeah, you came in at the very end. No. And the open no. comments were at the very end. You're, no, you're, you're mixing up the minutes of the no. committee with the minutes of the board. He's yeah, mistaking you for somebody else. Oh, okay. So, yeah, the committee. Sorry. Who was that? I need to find out. <laughs> <laughs> it was, wasn't me. It was you. Yeah. No. Okay. So, yeah. right, so, <laughs> it was you because you came in at the end of the meeting. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's agree to disagree and move on. Um, anything else from the ESS meeting? All right, let's move this on. Is, uh, I, I, I want to make a comment on, on this. I'm not sure if this is within the purview, that any agreement that is struck, we need to have paramedics uh, services that we're not getting. Taxpayers have been screwed for a couple of years. We need to, uh, Thank you. we have to address that. Okay, 
So that's off topic. As a board. That's off topic. I'm um, so sorry. I, Irv is completely right. It was Dan Kerr. Correct. And he was sitting in the same side and my Thank mind you. was going crazy. Thank you. All right, let's move on to item E3, Resolution 2018-01, declaring that governing body members and volunteers shall be deemed to be employees for the district for the purpose of providing workers' compensation coverage for said certain individuals while providing their services. Okay, this item was tabled uh, last month and asked uh, to grab some more information or obtain some more information. I did speak to the insurance care. I also reached out to a couple of other districts to find out how they went about this. Um, First off, uh, as I put in the memo here, there was some confusion over why board, why not commissions. Um, for workers' compensation purposes, the board, uh, the board of directors are considered employees because they make decisions on behalf of the district. The commissions do not have such a authority, uh, the final authority of everything lies with the board. So they look at it that way strictly for workers' compensation purposes. Um, I omitted a much longer, slightly more complex formula that arrives at the numbers in the chart, but I was asked to uh, calculate costs, uh, approximate on what it would cost us to add various levels of volunteers. Um, so I did do that. All of this is based off of hours spent volunteering times uh, rates, uh, federal minimum wage, plus uh, their classification rates for where they fall under. I use the three most common classifications that we have, which are non-manual, um, which is like what all of our park, uh, not our park, I'm sorry, all of our rec staff fall under with the exception of lifeguards. Uh, manual, which would be uh, like our park, uh, and then clerical, which are uh, really the only people that truly fall under clerical in our office is Carolyn and Paula. Uh, these numbers I gave you here, I just used a common number like 25 and punched in 25 hours to kind of show for somebody who's, say, helping at, at an event. If they uh, do 25 hours of volunteer time, which would need to be tracked and monitored, it would equal out to $8.28 per volunteer per year, um, so on and so forth. Manual, obviously, is much more expensive because they consider that a much higher risk. So if you're doing like work parties, build a playground, do something along those lines, uh, you're looking at 38, 43 for 25 hours worth of volunteer time. Uh, alternatively, a lot of the districts that I talked to and uh, even with the insurance company said what the vast majority of districts do is they basically implement waivers and releases of liability that volunteers sign. Uh, I put a sample of one that is in here that would be very easy to manipulate to uh, our needs, to call it a, a thing uh, under Marinwood. Ultimately, I think that's what I would recommend doing rather than trying to go through the process of tracking every volunteer, all of the hours, and as well as the added expense. I've volunteered and done a lot of volunteer activities organized in the past. Um, I think a simple release uh, of liability for volunteering when people come to you is not a deal breaker by any means for anybody and in fact it's kind of a standard procedure um, and that is the, that would be my recommendation on how I would move forward with it and I would keep the board remained as uh, covered again I listed the cost in there last time I think it was a total of $106 annually for all five total combined um, and again, seeing as that you are seen as employees, if you ultimately elect not to do that, you'd be changing the policy, and rather than electing to cover the boards with the use of this resolution, not doing it would be more of an action of choosing not to have the board covered under workers' comp. Something were to happen uh, while you're performing your duties, you would need to sue the district to redeem. That slightly, or could we amend that slightly to say approve for the board as is and not extend it to any other group and use the waiver as um, part of the policy? Second. All right, discussion. Right. Well, the district is now what 57 years old or so. I'm not aware of any of our volunteers talking about fire commissioners and parks and rec commissioners uh, getting injured on the job. 
and filing a claim. And when I was on the Parks and Rec Commission back last century, way back last century, we were a pretty hands-on group. Uh, I was the essentially the carpenter foreman for that footbridge across Miller Creek. And I remember pulling one of the big pool pumps and drilling holes in the concrete deck of the pool for other work. We were doing all sorts of things where I, I assume we could have gotten there. No one did. But I think this release form is just, it's a good way to, to discourage people, I think, from getting on the commissions. We want to encourage them, not discourage them. I would think that if we were going to have some type of release like this, that it be saved for when we had an actual volunteer kind of work party activity and ask then the participants to sign the waiver and release if we feel that's appropriate. But this thing I think is just way overreaching and it's just going to potentially discourage some good volunteers. saying is amazing. However, what you don't realize is that the people on the Park and Rec Commission don't do that kind of stuff anymore. So I don't think that issue would come up because they don't even pull weeds. I mean, I tried to get them to pull weeds all the time. And I was out there pull, digging and pulling weeds and nobody else would pull weeds. So. I mean, for years, I've never seen anybody volunteer to do anything on the Park and Rec Commission. So I don't know that that would discourage somebody because they don't volunteer. Um, oh. you know, just in response to yeah. that, I would theoretically, when the Parks and Rec Commission did this inspection where they went to different, each park over the last number of months, to do a facility report. What would happen if one of the commissioners basically tripped over a curb at the, you know, looking at the tennis courts or something? True. Uh, so, you know, it could happen. I mean, it hasn't historically. Oh, but that and wasn't a volunteer thing. That was a yep. work-related thing. Anyway, I, I, I think right. you ought to save this release if there is a real, honest to goodness, work party to do something and otherwise hold the status quo. I have a question. Was the, um, was the intent to have everyone that walks through the doors here or works in the park sign one of these things, or was it um, up, left up to the discretion of a particular function or manager or the district manager? Well, we don't, first off, utilize a ton of volunteers because we don't have a lot of events and a lot of our events, especially on the rec side, are actually manned by paid staff uh, because you're looking at the, you know, like the Halloween event or something along those lines, so they're already covered. One of the big ones that comes to mind that we utilize a lot of volunteers for is the Beer Fest. Um, same situation, I, I think asking them to volunteer, again, is my own personal opinion based on experience, uh, to sign one of these isn't... Uh, I don't think it's I, I don't think it's asking very much, nor do I think it leaves a bad taste in people's mouth. I know when the uh, Lions Club recently set up their thing that they did over on uh, the overpass, they had everybody sign a release form as well. Mm -hmm. um, my intent, I, I guess, to your point, uh, I was definitely going to present this to both commissions mm -hmm. at both of their next commission meetings. Uh, ask them to sign here, basically letting them know that this all kind of came through uh, our workers' comp carrier as a recommended practice and then go from there. I, I didn't envision much, if any, resistance whatsoever. I mean, I used to be a commissioner. I know I would have signed this. I have a dated outlook. I worked in nonprofit for years and we utilized a boat ton of volunteers. Uh, but with every volunteer that we brought on, it was a much more formal process of uh, not only something like this, but I mean, they had to go through background checks and everything else due to the nature of the work that I did back then. So. Okay. Any other questions, comments from the public? Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, all right. Uh, can I call the question? All those in favor? Aye. 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 All those opposed? No. 
Could you repeat the motion, please, so that I can understand it? Carolyn, do you have it? Yeah. Um. In fact, I think that's part of Robert's rules. Before you um, vote, you're supposed Thank to repeat the motion, especially if it's kind of long. So they're going to approve to the board as is and implement waiver as policy for volunteers. Good, thank you. Okay. Um, item E4, Marine Wind CSD internal controls and fraud prevention policy draft. Mm -hmm. So this is um this is the first draft that um, um we put together and um um whether with his knowledge or not Eric wrote most of it. <laughs> um, so um, basically the policies, oh, well, I'm sorry, the practices are in place already. Uh, this is merely um, putting it on a piece of paper, making it formal. Um, the idea is to formalize um, the processes you have in place. Uh, to prevent fraud, um, many have to do with division of uh, segregation of duties. Um, what we are adding here is um, so basically the systems control is uh, system controls is um, what what happens now and um, the um, section two of uh, procedure which is the um, investigation of irregularities is um, a standard sort of, but um, definitely it's a draft, so. Um, Do we need to make a motion, or is this just for a comment? I, I believe this is the first reading, so maybe we can, um, I mean, if there is absolutely no comments, then. It says approve on the board action. It, it can be approved. It certainly doesn't have to be approved. Okay. Perfect, perfect. Um, questions, comments from the board? Um, a couple of questions with regard to QuickBooks. QuickBooks has a audit trail, uh, an alterable audit trail accompanying the system. Is that correct? I'm not sure I completely understand what you're asking. Okay, an audit trail is um, you know, how many people can sign on to QuickBooks? Carolyn and myself. Okay, so every time you make a transaction within QuickBooks, it logs your right. transaction. Yes. It tells you yes. who did it, when they did it, right. reversal, anything. Every every journal entry. Correct. Mm -hmm. Okay. Right. Very good. Thank you. Mm -hmm. and I would say, I mean, this came really from an, uh, an informal conversation with our auditor. We we're talking about a lot of the policies we put in place since last year, uh, and somehow this one had come up. So, you know, because I think I probably even asked him what would be some of the ones you suggest for us to kind of focus on moving forward. And he said, look, you guys have all the practices. It'd be very easy to put that into a policy and have a more formal fraud uh, fraud prevention policy. He sent me a couple samples. Uh, uh, thank you to Isabella, because I, I believe I provided those, as well as the document uh, that was provided to the auditor that says this is what we do to prevent fraud. These are our practices. So to Isabella's point, mostly she took the practices that we do and put them into a policy form, of which he has no uh, findings uh, with our practices. He thinks our practices are, are good, especially given our size and scope. So there's a comment in here that we do not um, approve accounts receivable. Correct? Right. Okay, so do we sell advertising in the review? Yeah. Okay, how do we put that in the system? How does that work? Active net. Active net? Mm -hmm. So that's one of the things. Okay. Mm -hmm. Fair enough. Any other questions from the board? Okay. Um, questions, comments from the public? It definitely sounds like Mr. Naylor has read the policy, and obviously Isabella has, because she wrote it, correct? Have the three of you also read the entire policy and spent any time thinking about it? Yes? Read Mr. It. Shea, you read it? Didn't yes? think about it. But you didn't think about it. <laughs> okay. And Mr. Schwartz? Oh, I thought about it and read it. Okay. And, and the only concern I had was that was answered when Mr. Naylor asked the question. It seems to be relying on QuickBooks a lot, 
and I didn't quite understand how just because we have a computer program that, that, that provides fraud protection, and that's been explained. Okay, thank you. Well, I just wanted to make sure because in the past there have been things approved that haven't been read, so um, just wanted to make sure. Thank you. Any other questions from the public? Yes. So, uh, so I'm delighted that this policy is in place, um, and maybe I should ask, you know, it's fine to have the policy, but how does it get resolved, and how does it come see the light of day, if there is an irregularity? Um, how do we know? Um, so that's um, in number two. And, um, I, I don't have my glasses. Could you explain what number two is that? So, okay, so section two outlines the process. What would happen if something, um, if, if irregularities happen? Okay, so does it come before the board? Is it publicly re reported? How does it get resolved? I, the reason I'm bringing this up, and I mentioned this last couple meetings, is we don't know with a lot of these activities where you know what the revenues are where the costs are whether an event actually nets out with money i mean they get reported that way but we never see the the actual figures so it's all kind of very informal it sounds like you're trying to address this with a formal policy which is a great idea but without the transparency, um, I think it has limited value. So I, I mean, we, uh, so just a hypothetical, $2,000 is missing. How does, what, what happens at that point? So it, uh, this is a very general question. You would have to give me a specific example and uh, based on the well, situation, it, it, is it something you would that, be able to okay. address it. Um, it depends on in which moment this okay. so, so dollars get missing? Can I interrupt? I, I really think you need to read the policy, Stephen, and to give us a sense. Thank you. I, I have some more. Uh, I'm, I think I'm still talking. Um, so if Eric, say, found $2,000 missing, what happens at that point? Does he report it to the board Does a, uh, in a public meeting? Is so either he uh, investigates or he can appoint an investigator. Okay. Um, and uh, he can also forward it to authorities for investigation. It's really within his discretion. If he is the person in question, then uh, the uh, reporting person would be contacting the president of the board, who could either investigate or appoint the investigator. Okay. And then um, uh, the outcomes um, are including termination and forwarding and, and to the district, is explicit in the district attorney office. Did, did you've written this out? Did, this is, okay, thank you. Uh, do we want to make a motion regarding this at this time? Do we, what, what's our sort of feeling take process? Um, with anything that, well, this is not a two-liner. Uh, there's complexity. I'd like uh, to follow up on what Isabella said earlier that this is a first reading. I'd like to, you know, we presented it in public. We've asked some questions. I'd like to have another opportunity to look at it before we vote on uh, okay. putting so it in place. On the agenda for next one. That's what I would recommend. Yeah. Thank you. I appreciate that. All right, moving on to district manager report. Yeah, one second, sir. You have two minutes. Eric, and then we'll be on time. That's beautiful. <laughs> okay, uh, district manager report. Uh, I did get a draft from Miller Pacific. I'm actually scheduled to have a phone call with uh, Geotech tomorrow just to kind of walk through, make sure I fully understand everything that's in there. From there, uh, we will finalize his report and I will send it off to uh, FEMA so that they can finalize their project worksheets, which will also come with their. Uh, Estimates as to you know based on Caltrans formulas as to what they think it would cost to fix it uh, The good news is neither fix is very complex um, So 
so I will, uh, once I work with them, the next steps would then be, like I said, send that particular report off to them, uh, FEMA, just so that they have it in their possession, and then uh, Miller Pacific can go working on a, uh, a, an engineered fix. Um, I think I kind of quoted them in here somewhere uh, along those lines of what they would do next. Um, and I definitely wanted to kind of put in there uh, what they put, this is again all from a draft report, but I don't anticipate too much of this uh, changing. And I think for the purposes of this meeting, uh, the kind of key line here is the side of the building adjacent to the slide consists of a five or six foot deep retaining wall and does not appear to be threatened by the slide, which appears to be less than two or three feet thick. The adjacent building is referring to is the pool pump house. Um, and that I know was the item of the largest concern. They're basically recommending some levels of grading um, and then diverting some of the water that was heading in that direction through roof gutters, so on and so forth. Uh, not a massive fix, but the grading still needs to uh, go through geologic inspection, geotechnical engineering uh, to go from there. And then they would also perform some levels of construction oversight to make sure that we put this project out. Whoever does this project does it right and does it to their specified plans. Um, when I speak with them tomorrow, I will try to get some cost estimates on it as well um, on what they think the cost of the work would be because that will determine whether or not it goes into a bidding process or if it's under a, the $25,000 threshold, it can be uh, performed without having to go through that process as well. Um, Park maintenance facility. Uh, I have contacted three local design architects. I met with two of them uh, on site. I have received uh, an initial proposal from one of them. I'm expecting a second proposal from the other one uh, this week. At some point, the third person uh, I traded a couple phone messages with, and then he hasn't uh, gotten back to me, so I'm just kind of taking it because I'm a job that he's interested in, and I'm kind of moving forward with the other two. Um, from there, we're just we're continuing to Earth Point to develop the site plan review application. That'll be submitted to the county. It's going to include uh, the initial design concept by the architect, the site plan, the biological site assessment that you were shared last week, uh, as well as any other little items that need to go in there with it. Earth can probably speak to that a little bit better. And I nothing's popping to mind, but I think that's the majority of it. Uh, on that. Um, other items of note within my report, uh, the financial audit, like I said, all field work has been completed. Uh, I'm expecting this week as well a draft audit report for review and comment. Uh, fully anticipate that the auditor will be here next month to present. Uh, and then the fire station kitchen, on a quick note, just to make it very clear, the request for bids has gone out. Uh, the chief and I worked based on some of the feedback we got from the last meeting, revised the uh, bid package to degrees and actually changed a little bit of the format on how we did and included a handful of quote unquote bid alternatives to scale back the base bid as good as we could in hopes that we could get something back that is within a reasonable amount that will be approved. Uh, and if there's room within there, we can always add on some of the bid alternatives. All of the documents are actually on our website. They've gone out to the Marin Builders Association, who in turn helped it get out to all of the other uh, builders, regional builders associations, as well as the California Builders Exchange. And then we've run public notice twice now in the IJ. Um, in terms of the timelines on both, um, for the kitchen, uh, since the uh, deadline is January 31st, we would be looking at our regularly scheduled meeting to potentially approve one of the... Yes, for February. For February. Mm -hmm. And then um, it would take a couple of weeks, three weeks, to complete the project? Uh, I think it would probably take more than that. The, within the RF, uh, the request, the invitation for bids, I think it says they have 90 days from being awarded the contract to complete. Um, Doesn't mean they're going to take 90 days, it just says that's how long they have within the contract by which to complete it. And uh, in terms of the 
um, sorry, site review for uh, application for the shed. Um, what timeline are you looking at there? Uh, I'm waiting to get both proposals so I can look at both design uh, proposals. I was kind of been doing some of this in conjunction with some of Herb's guidance and help because he's got more experience looking at these things than I do. Based on what exactly those proposals entail, we'll decide whether uh, uh, we're comfortable moving forward or whether we think both proposals need to come to the uh, uh, be discussed and then we can choose one of the two designers from there uh, I would assume probably four to six weeks for them to put together their uh, final materials that could get to us to then be submitted into the county uh, the county is taking a long time at this point in time uh, but we've already kind of had a planner quasi assigned who also said when you submit this, be sure to let me know so she can get in on it. She's already familiar with the project and the hopes that'll help us move a little bit quicker. Uh, I can't give you a great timeline on how long some of those things will take other than I'm waiting for the second proposal. Uh, based on that, uh, we will decide how best to move forward. If it needs to come here, it'll come here. And if it is something that we feel, I mean, the project's being budgeted and I think this is an aspect of the project. The budget board's been approved and we, It'll be well under that, um, and I just I can't tell you how long the county will take. I have no idea. G given that it usually takes longer, I would uh, I wouldn't be surprised if, if there if are you two. Can, if you can move the sky, we and align trying. the stars on both projects to Understood. kind of usher them. Understood. A couple of comments. First, on the creek uh, project. Yes, those are construction drawings, not planning drawings that we will be proposing to, to complete. But Sorry. you need to make sure who's going to take care of the permitting. Right. I, I, it would be great if Miller Pacific did it. Because that would avoid bringing on another consultant. Either that or the uh, construction. I will say the permitting is going to have to go through various levels of environmental compliance too, just because it's right on the creek bank. Um, so I'm sure like we're in county storm water pollution prevention is going to want to know what's going on. Fish and wildlife may very well want to know what's going on. There'll have to be preventative measures put in place even though all you're talking about is grading. And they don't even want you to push dirt into the creek. So it's, uh, uh, those will be certainly an aspect, uh, not to mention FEMA has uh, compliance people on there and uh, are there to help you through that process as well. Just so we, we know, they either are going to do it or aren't going to do it, that's my concern. Right. Then on the, uh, the firehouse kitchen, uh, I believe that the contract documents say 60 days, not 90. Okay, sorry. The last time I read it. But uh, my, I've still not seen the plans. Are they on the website now? I emailed them to you. When? That night. Were they when attached they to it? Okay, I didn't see the Yeah, it was an email that I forwarded to you. Uh, the plans are not on the website. The plans have gone out to the Builder Sites uh, uh, Association. I mean, we can post them to the website. There's no reason not to that I can think of other than we just we didn't post the plans last time. Uh, with that said, I know the chief got all of one phone call last time, too, and one person who came to visit. Uh, but most of these contractors are hearing and learning of this through the Builders Association. That's where they're available. And there's very clear instructions in the invitation to bid on how to get everything. And it's basically email the chief. If you need a printed out copy, it costs $25. Otherwise, we'll email you an electronic copy for free. All right. Any other that questions? That answers my questions. Okay. Any comments? Oh, I just wanted to ask, in the, um, now that you have architects and you're going to be doing some designs and stuff, has the trailer, you know, the old office trailer, which is now not really used very much, has that been included in any of this? Or is the old trailer just going to stay where it is and not be used for very much? Uh, that's to be determined. I would disagree that it's not used for very much. It, the park guys are in there every single day utilizing that. It's also got a bathroom. Oh, right. I know. They use it for else. air conditioning. They use it for the bathroom. They use it for their lunches um, and computers, probably. Mm -hmm. But it, with Gary here, it used to be used a lot more. Uh, Gary spent more time in there. <laughs> I, <don't know laughs> I, say, uh, I didn't say it. You did. Uh, I did. Uh, 
uh, those are options and it's yet to be determined because those are things that we've talked about is if that trailer was to get uh, incorporated into a single building uh, and moved or if it is to stay as it is with the building there those are all options to explore cost as a factor site layout as a factor and we'll uh, weigh those when more clear uh, uh, conclusions have been reached okay but so for right now the architects are just dealing with the open area, the maintenance shed, and the leaking part? Um, not entirely. Oh, okay. No, they, they are understanding that uh, there's not an intention to move the modular at this point in time, okay. but if uh, they can create a compelling reason why we should, okay. then that is something that hasn't necessarily been ruled out either. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. Um, I have a question. Um, who, who, Eric, who are you working with at the uh, county, the woman that you mentioned? The planner, her name is Tammy Taylor. Okay. Um, and it sounds like there's just one choice now as, as far as the location of that shed. Uh, that's all you're getting drawings for, is that correct? At this point in time. And which, which footprint is that? It was site option layout two that flipped the building around, moved it back closer uh, over by where the maintenance shed is, kind of right in front, not the maintenance shed, done in the modular unit. Okay. And you determined you need all that space for three guys? Uh, we haven't determined exactly how much space we need yet. That's why we're how, 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 what's, the, what's the footprint? We don't have a footprint yet. Well, but 4,000 square feet, 2,000? Yeah, I would say we, anything. I've been talking something closer to. A thousand to fifteen hundred square feet, maybe. Plus this, plus the shed. Yeah. yeah, maybe. But that's all to be determined, and that's one of the things I've talked to the architects about. And uh, they have seen all the documents that are up on our website, and they're utilizing our internal kind of needs assessment to do what they do and say, here's how you can. They know maximizing space is a priority. Okay. Um, so, have you, has the board elected to ignore the, the the public's uh, comments, the, their concerns about that site, are you planning to bring them in again, or are you just going to move forward with what you guys think is, is the right plan? Well, I can't speak for the board, but... I'm just talking about the, the process, that's all. The process will remain as public and transparent as it has, Stephen. I, we have no... But are right you... It's but, all initial. Okay, but it sounds like you've... There was, you know, quite a... A, a range of opinions there. Uh, there was. And uh, in fact, pretty strong objections to the relocation of that. That, I mean, if you move forward, it's going to still be there. So I'm just wondering what is the process plan to address that? Uh, well, right now we're going to see what the county has to say, which is where that the meeting left off. Okay. Because uh, they haven't weighed in on any level of a formal opinion as to the buildability of that site. Okay. Uh, all their opinions have been in less formal uh, meeting settings with them. So that's the purpose of putting together the site plan review application, and then they will be able to have a, a more of a written opinion on it. Okay. So just two two other things. As far as the the trailer goes, I think that would be a wonderful location for. Uh, a nature uh, nursery school in that general area. Yeah, Beautiful. Yeah. Um, and that would generate revenue and it would use the park for its intended purpose, uh, recreation and education. Mm -hmm. Secondly, um, you know, the environmental concerns are still going to be there and I'm still very concerned about any location uh, of the maintenance shed there. And so, as you move forward, you move forward as if you wish, but um, the further you get into this, it, it may get difficult because uh, there are definite environmental concerns. Thanks. Taking Linda's lead, I'm wondering if Stephen has read the biological assessment that we had. Prepared. Yes, I have, and it's I, it's it's fine. I I. I read nature books before and it's really not actually very informative. I'm concerned about the uh, subsurface geology there, the, the drainage patterns, the fact that you're using cancerous chemicals 
in uh, in that facility. It's a completely inappropriate use of a uh, location for an industrial site. So, yeah, I've read it, I understand it, and I know that you know there'll be a lot of interest uh, through the regulators. Can we move on to the next item? I do have one quick question for the district manager. Does um, it sounds like the location next to the fire department building is way, 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 way down on the list to even think about? Mm -hmm. It hasn't been thrown out completely, though. Is that correct? Nothing has been thrown out. Okay, but with the architects, you're talking about the area specifically where the maintenance sheds are right now. At this point in time. Thank you. All right, moving on to item F, fire department matters. First, we have a fire activity summary and chief report, and no chief. Does anyone um, have any questions that anybody else could potentially answer? Her? Uh, one question on the, on the emergency call at 1677 Lucas Valley Road. I'm wondering if anybody knows, was there any issue getting access to the site with the gate at the bottom of the hill? Anybody know? Because years back, that was a problem. Unfortunately, I don't believe any of us were on that call. Well, I requested that, that, we, that I get an answer to that question at the next meeting. There was no, no problem. I was there. Yeah, there were three fire engines open. But the gate was open and stayed open. The gate was open. Okay. A time that I remember, the first engine went up and the gate closed. And the second engine got there with two more behind it, and the gate was closed. And I just about put a tow chain on the gate when it fi and pulled it away when it finally opened again. But there was, I don't know what the issue was. But you've answered my question. Because the number of access gates are around the neighborhood now. And I don't know if we have ways of bypassing their electronic systems or whatever, or what happens when the electricity is out. Some of the gates are equipped with uh, the Knox box, which is the, uh, is the key system that we have to get into commercial buildings, where we lock a box outside of the structure and we're able to access it and get a key. And sometimes that same key will work for gates where they'll, they'll open the gate. Uh, that's not speaking for all of them, but that's definitely a possibility with a lot of them. Can I asked some really silly questions. I just was learning about Knox boxes today. Is it a like it, how do you get into all of them? Is it the same code? Uh, or, or, no, so some Knox boxes are different. Our previous Knox box and our, and our yellow fire engine was, uh, it's, and it's stuck in a locked box that's inside the fire engine. And we would radio dispatch and we'd send a code to that box, which would unlock it, and we could release the key. Um, now it's done through personal codes. So we each have a personal code that we can unlock and then that main key is a master key for all those lost boxes that are stuck to the side of structures. There's one out front of the fire so I'm not sure there might be one in front of this building where we can open it to get access and inside that box to be master keys to the building. Okay, got it, got it. That, you're, you're, you're leading me slowly to where I'm going, and that is I would like to, I think some agencies have ordinances, rules, whatever, about having Knox boxes or similar types of facilities on any you know, gate that separates the property from the public street. And I would request that either the chief or the commission look into what we have in the way of requirements, and if not, uh, take a look at placing some requirements, because there's a lot of I don't know. There, there's two of them I'm aware of on the north side of Lucas Valley Road. The Monaghan one, we were here the last meeting, and there's one at the end of Bridgegate. And then on the south side, there's uh, the one that they had to go through to get to 1677. And there's a couple more along there. There's the one on the Stone House. In fact, there's two gates to that house. Uh, and there's others. And it's just, we shouldn't have to wait and figure out how to get in or have to tear them down. Uh, other agencies do have requirements to, that provide some emergency access. That's true, Chief. Yeah. 
Uh, a, it definitely is a better question for the chief, and I plead ignorance before I even state this, but I'm not sure if something like that is included in the local fire code. And I know probably about a year ago, I believe, uh, the chief presented an updated fire code. It might have been a little bit more, maybe right before you got here, or uh, uh, presented an updated fire code ordinance that was adopted by the board. I don't know if it's included in that or not. It might very well be. Uh, I don't know if one of these gentlemen know or not. Uh, but to your point, I wrote it down, and we'll pass it on to Chief Roach and ask. Great, because if it is a requirement, not everyone's abiding by it. Sure. Well, we'll, we'll, it's an insert requirement topic here, I think. Thank you. Fighters that qualify as paramedics, but we're wasting their abilities and causing them to waste the time and effort they put into getting those certifications, in my opinion. Uh, but what I asked last time, because I remember loud and clear when I was on the fire commission, that we were told that once we start the program, San Rafael will pay the difference for, of the firefighter's salary and provide or pay for the equipment. And the chief last meeting said, no, that's not the case. We would have to go to a ballot measure and raise more money. And I, I'm trying to find out what's, what, what's, who's on first here. Um, okay, just so that I am clear that I'm understanding your question is, when we are able to implement paramedics, is San Rafael going to pay for the paramedic incentive as well as all of the equipment and materials needed based on our current shared services agreement? Yes. Correct. And if that is not the case... That is, it yes. is the case. Well, it, okay, he's because the chief in the minutes said it was not the case. He was talking about the paramedic tax, and Marinwood did not raise their system level of San Rafael. So I think he was saying something about, you know, at some point we're going to have to raise our tax. Yeah, but that up. wasn't my question. Right. So, but I, I think the wires, I, I'm, I'm seeing where the, the streams are crossing a little bit. Does that make sense? Yeah. But if, as soon as we start to say, hey, we're going with the paramedic program, we, it isn't going to cost us any more money because we're already paying into the program through San Rafael. Yeah, right. I, I, well, it's gotten caught up in politics for a number of years. And well, so none of the agreements that were previously stated have been upheld. Um, well, my concern is I, I, I've gotten the services of the paramedics three times now, and they, they did a great job, and I'm here to be at the meeting. <laughs> but, uh, you know, maybe somebody else isn't going to be so lucky. And why aren't we implementing the paramedic service? Why is the labor group allowed to regulate our level of service to our taxpayers? And they're also really cheating three of their own members uh, from getting more pay to reimburse them for the time and effort and money they spent to get certified as paramedics. Something isn't computing. Amen. It's not for many years with the paramedic and what's been going on, unfortunately. Uh, Ron? Yes, as uh, the commissioner representing County Service Area 13, uh, I agree with what Herb has said. We had also expected, since we're paying for paramedic service, the whole idea was to have it on our engine rather than have to wait for San Rafael response. Since we're all paying for paramedic service, we wanted the most expedition possible. And I had discussions with uh, the San Rafael chief at the time. And they were gonna pay out of the, I think $92 a year each of our residents pay for paramedic service, they were going to pay for the difference in pay between firefighter and firefighter paramedic. So there would be no additional cost, and they would pay for uh, whatever equipment was needed to equip uh, our engines to the same level as the San Rafael engines to provide paramedic service. And I don't understand what's going on with uh, the firefighters union, which is doing something to delay implementation of full paramedic service to the taxpayers in Marinwood and CSA 13. You got it. <clears throat> we have, I mean. That's all we need to be said. Yeah. Well, other than the fact that um, it's also in San Rafael's best interest 
to make sure that we have paramedics on our engine since we cover a great deal of their territory. Exactly. Most of our paramedics, most of our medical calls are in the city of Santa. That is correct. So it's to their benefit also. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, Alrighty, item F2, Resolution 2018-2, Government Code Section 215. Are we, are we, is there public comment on that? Um, we just had public comment. Do you have a comment? Yeah. Uh, so I, uh, I agree with uh, Irv and uh, Ron here. Um, but I want to uh, just say that this, if we're getting ripped off, folks, you've got to you got to write this, and it's got to be it's got to be a negotiation point that you put on the desk of the uh, Sam Rafael chief. Say, look, we got to get this settled. We're going to do, be doing something with the future of our firefighters, and this is something that you should use to uh, extract a good deal uh, from Sam Rafael. Thank you. <laughs> All right, item F2. Mm, this is my mouth is full. Would anybody like to make a motion? Motion to approve resolution 2018-02. I second that. Any discussion? I can present whatever it is on this you want me to present. I mean, we've been through, uh, in my time, uh, I've been through this process before. Uh, Captain Heine's is slightly different in that he has actually uh, applied for what is known as a service retirement pending industrial disability. Um, he is formally and officially retired from service from the district as of 1230. Uh, he did this for his own personal reasons as far as doing service pending. Uh, he, uh, as such though, the district will not be making any, what is known as advanced disability pension payments, even though these are fully reimbursed by CalPERS, he will not be receiving these because he's already been placed on the pension roll by CalPERS. Um, so he is good there. Uh, all this resolution is stating is that uh, you are aware that uh, he was injured. You are aware that he filed a workers' comp claim that was accepted. You have seen the medical record uh, from a qualified independent medical examiner that says he has, uh, uh, his injury will not allow him to perform the duties of a firefighter any longer. Uh, and that's what this is. The actual determination of a, uh, uh, whether or not his disability retirement, industrial disability retirement is approved is up to CalPERS. It is not up to this board. You're just stating that you have seen these things and you concur with these statements. Okay. Any public comment? Okay. All right. The date of the next fire commission meeting is February. We, 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 we need a moment. <laughs> 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 Thank you. Um, well, let's call the question. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. Sorry about that. Uh, the next fire commission meeting is February 6th. <coughs> Moving on to item G, park and rec matters. First, we have the recreation and park maintenance activity reports. Uh, yeah, as far as the rec side of things, um, just real quick, um, our next event is our Razy Boss winter wine tasting, which is scheduled for Saturday, February 24th, from 2 to 5 here at the King Center. It's one of our most popular winter events. Um, I believe Luke has already procured 10 or 11 wineries, uh, and we have uh, hope to get a few more, so um, come join us for that. Um, <clears throat> it says summer financials attached. So they didn't get attached. Um, we'll swing back to those in a few minutes. Um, we do need to, it's the time of the year where we need to get our summer camp pool and pool rates um, approved by the board. So Robin and Luke are here. Um, I'm obviously here to answer any questions as well. Um, if we can start with the summer camp, please. Um, which there's an attachment for. And 
We're looking at a 3% increase in camp rates this year. I believe we had a 3% last year as well. 3% um, is about standard uh, year to year for us. We're still competitively priced. But uh, if you also look at the Sorry. financials that I just talked out, the summer camps did extremely well last year. Um, this just kind of keeps us on that same trajectory. And I don't know if Robin wants to speak any more about summer camp rates. But. No, I think uh, as far as camps go, we're you know, one of the most reasonable prices, um, especially for the quality that we provide, which I'm biased, but I think it's one of the best, if not the best, camp in Marin County. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think 3% is very reasonable for our community. Any uh, questions? Or did you want to do camp and Corey? Is it the same? We should probably do it separate. Yeah. Okay. So do I hear a motion for the camp rates? Um, yes, I move that we approve camp rates as presented. Uh, second that. Okay. Um, discussion? Sure. I'm just. Do you have a feel for the number of residents as compared to non-residents who participate in the program? Yeah, I mean, we send out surveys annually. Um, we're about a 70-30 split at this point, with 30% being residents. That number is a little misleading, is in that we get a large portion of the community to come out to our camps. But the overall makeup, obviously, we pull from Terra Linda over the hill here on Mount Marin, a little bit from Nevada, et cetera. And they do, and the non-residents pay what we think is a decently um, priced difference, um, and those rates are listed on the comparison. And I was going to say, you're using myself as an example. Like I think I'm a resident and like a heavy user of the camp because I enroll. I my I, my assumption is that I enroll both my kids in the camp all summer long, and I just I sign them all up at the beginning of February whenever it opens, and then I'll pull them once I figure out my summer vacation schedule. But most of my friends who live in Marinewood are my kids' friends' parents. They enroll them like a week at a time here and there. And so, you know, everybody's different, but in terms of a community member, like I see a lot of school friends who are there on a spot basis, and then there's the ones who are like, this is where we are for the summer, you know, in terms of residence. So, I mean, I get that like the pool would be different, depending, you know, pulling from lots of places where people are figuring out what do you do with the kids during the summer. Another anecdotal uh, story is the fact that because a full member has, a non-resident full member uh, has a benefit of early registration for camps, um, quite a few families I know actually end up purchasing a full membership whether they need it or not, just so they can register for camps early. And, um, it's M Mount Marin, Dixie parents, you know, so even though not within the community, District limits, very much a community. No, but my okay. Where I'm going with this was, do we have a capacity problem that's precluding any of our residents, particularly? No, and that's one of the reasons we opened up registration two weeks early for residents to ensure that they have ample time to register for the camps. Um, it's definitely something we're constantly like listening for and getting feedback on. Um, last year, by opening up two weeks early. We didn't get much feedback from residents saying like, oh, this is our camps and we weren't able to get in. Um, for people that, if they're signing up for the whole summer, let's say, and they're a resident, and it's a stretch for them financially, we also offer payment plans um, so that, you know, they can enroll during the period when all the camps are open and we'll spread their payments out over the summer. You know, I, you know what I was thinking about is, I think it was Stephen that was saying that the pool, that, that some of the use, it, we're at capacity there sometimes, and so the residents aren't getting maybe the full enjoyment of that particular facility because of the non-residents. Well, I think Stevens are trying to lap swim, which yeah. is kind of a whole separate. But so the same concept. Itself. I just want to make sure we aren't causing sure we that watching. same problem with the camps. Yeah, and you're no, saying no. No, and then, like I said, it's something we definitely analyze on a year-to-year -year basis to make sure that we're giving uh, residents first crack and making sure that we're providing them with the services that they pay for via taxes. If anyone complains, it's usually because they waited till May or June to sign up and of course by then people. Cool. You do fill up your sessions though? Yeah. You can your kidneys are the ones that are like the highest. 
Um, any other comment, public? Let's see. Did we get everybody up here? Comments, questions? Uh, any public comments on camp rates? Stephen? Um, yeah, so I'm far beyond uh, paying for summer camps for kids, but if uh, I know we do a great job, and you'll hear this the first year, I think. I don't know if you were here last year. But I think that if you have a quality product and it's the best product, it should be priced accordingly. Um, in my mind, there's, there's residents and there's customers. And the customers are people who come in and utilize our services. I think that the uh, price discrimination uh, between residents and non-residents should be very should be broad and should be uh, so three percent fine i just want to make sure that uh, we are maximizing quality of our the experience as well as getting an adequate return on the investment that we do put forth so three percent just seems a little conservative to me um, for a great product that's in high demand. Thank that's you. it. Um, can I call the question? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Uh, so now we'll do pool rates. So for the pool this year, um, we're recommending a 2% increase in our pool membership rates um, and keeping our drop in and punch pass prices the same as last year. Uh, we saw a slight uptick in pool memberships last year, um, as well as a slight uptick in drop-ins and punch pass usage. Um, the 2% for the pool basically covers some expenditures we're expecting to increase as far as minimum wage and staffing. And the pool doesn't see quite the same demand as our summer camp programs, um, so we feel like the 2% kind of keeps us competitive with Carolina and Hamilton. And Luke's here to chime in on anything as well. Yeah, you know, one other thing to add is that we we did not change the membership prices last year, but we did uh, increase the, the drop ins and the punch pass prices, so we're just kind of evening out this, this time around. I have a motion. So moved. I'll second that. But I also have. Um, I don't even know how we would be able to analyze it, but um, sometimes I wonder if drastically lowering the membership rate for, for residents would encourage residents to just buy the membership rather than drop-in rates, uh, rather than pay drop-in rates, and therefore, but it's just a hunch I have, but I have no proof to, <laughs> to uh, substantiate. Um, and it would be interesting to to know if we would get more traction on the memberships, because I know this is kind of our, uh, that's our goal, right? To maximize um, memberships, or not necessarily. I mean, it's a debate we have to, like, sometimes it makes sense, sometimes it's better for us, people just buy punch passes. Um, they end up coming more than they think, they end up spending more money on the punch passes. Um, you know, like I said, the pool memberships continue to tick up, which is, you know, for years they were going down, 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 down. So is that for residents or non-residents? Both. The membership? Yeah, across the board. Yeah. So in, only in the last three years um, we've seen an uptick. You know, we do have the incentive with the summer camp program, getting the discounts, also the you know having people register um, to get that early registration by purchasing the punch or by purchasing the Membership. memberships. So everything is we're happy kind of holding the line with a slight uptick, with the full success for us financially. You know, I, I know a tremendous amount of analysis goes into this and also um, competitive thinking, so, and kind of pricing us just right, so I appreciate that effort. Do you folks feel at all that there's any risk from a capacity standpoint with Lucas Valley School possibly closing down? Um, in terms of their, their members coming to our pool mm -hmm. and you like, uh, I don't get the feeling that that pool, from what I've observed in some of the lifeguards and staff that we know that have worked there in the last couple of years, um, the pool's not very busy, uh, and 
So as far as our capacity, I'm not worried about it. Um, it would be negligent. Yeah, we had a bigger, uh, when Hamilton was closed, we saw a lot more uh, swimmers coming to the pool that particular year when they were, when they were shut down. But I wouldn't say it adversely affected our ability to provide you know, pool space for the people that needed it at that time. And I think this will be a much smaller impact than, than that was. Okay, because they also have a master's program. Um, if the pool closes, they've got a swim team. You know, yeah, would be they actually, yeah, uh, yeah, cool. I swam for three years. Um, I know they're, they, I've talked to them, they're, they're shopping around to find way, you know, places to try to spread spread their things out among all the pools and you know, that they're nearby. They haven't formally asked for, for anything from us, but um, okay, I mean, uh, you're obviously aware, yeah, yeah. I've talked to some of their um, board members and stuff, just they're kind of coming out what's. What are the other places? What are the relationships with other pools and stuff? So, but no one's come to me with any requests so far. But. Okay, thank you. I have a question on the first I heard of it. Um, why are they closing or they can't closing? Well, the last I heard, well, like I said, I swam there for three winters and this and that. Um, the maintenance has been somewhat indifferent in that pool, and the um, water flow is substandard, and the county's threatening if they don't figure out how to get you know, for sanitary reasons, to get the flow up to a normal standard, they're going to close the pool down. Mm -hmm. That's the last I heard, anyway. So. Okay. Uh, all right. Any other comments, questions from the board on pool? Okay. Stephen. Okay. So, uh, first of all, we have the best school, uh, I think, in in the area, and I don't even think Terra Linda, Hamilton, even Ray. Uh, I'm sure Jeff would agree. A uh, uh, couple things. Uh, I, I do think that uh, you know competitively, when you have the, something that is the best, you should price it appropriately. And um, so, two percent to me is very conservative. Um, and also, I'd like to see wider uh, price discrimination between residents and non-residents or customers, as I call them. Um, uh, I, I would like to see, um, I'd like to see more evening out, I, I actually discussed this uh, with uh, Shane and Luke earlier, but, uh, you know, one of the problems the pool has, as far as memberships go, is its limited hours. Um, because of the water devils, um, if you work in the city, you're not really swimming in the pool for at least half the season. Um, you're not able to swim at six o'clock when you come home. Um, and on the weekends with the schedule of meets, uh, at least last year and apparently this year too, the whole month of June is shot. So it really, it makes more sense if you're kind of a light swimmer to uh, just do punch passes. I would like to see more um, attention paid to the residents' needs um, who are largely working um, and unable to swim during evening hours and on weekends, which means that uh, the water devils may have to share a little bit more of the pool uh, with the community. Um, and I, I just think that it's, it's about time. If you look at the revenue, I think uh, you'll see that they get a heck of a good deal, uh, a, a lot of access for uh, minimal amounts of money. So, so that's it. I do have a question out of that, um, the water devils. I haven't asked this question in probably like 10 years. Like, what's our agreement with them? Like, uh, or, uh, we don't see that, like we see this stuff. Does it change or is that a static? So did they pay us on a per swimmer basis? Um, is it 100 this year? Um, I believe it's $100 this season um, per swimmer. Um, we changed it. They used to have to buy a pool membership. Um, the per swimmer fee actually ends up working out better for us um, financially, and it seemed to 
be tolerated by them at this point. So we up that each year. So that's what we get from them. They're, they are able to apply that fee towards a membership if they choose to buy one. So it doesn't really affect that end of things. Um, but yeah, that's our main revenue source from them is that personal fee. Wait a second. I didn't know that. It's a water devil family. Then you get. You get the hundred bucks off your full membership. Yeah, right. I double paid last year. Not if you're doing it. Apparently not. I learned something new out of this. Awesome. How many? Uh, how many uh, water devils are there? Two twenty-five ish. I think we had last year. So you're getting twenty-two thousand from. Which is more than. We're doing well compared to other agencies as far as getting revenue from our swim teams. And that list, that's listed here on the pool revenue? Yes. Um, it just, it's mixed in under pool revenue, I believe. Because then you, uh, you have a counter with swim team reimbursement. So Luke can explain that. Yeah, the swim team reimbursement is because they, um, the swim team covers the cost of the staffing during their practice and their meets. So, um, do they all cover it? They no, cover they cover the total cost of that. We do have a uh, special universal rate that we pay our lifeguards during those hours to make it easier for them to, you know, predict something when we staff at different uh, levels of experience and whatever. They all make the same rate when they're when they're guarding for uh, the swim team um, events and practice. But they pay that to us at the end. We have uh, keep track of those hours and then uh, bill them, and so that comes in in that, that line. And they pay for 100% of their garments, which they used to not, which used to not be the case. Are there any other revenue streams we can extract from? Ice, ice cream. Yeah, buy a lot of ice cream during uh, their practices from us. Oh. <coughs> can I throw out Snack bar, like, yeah. Okay. All right. I'd like to throw out an idea. If Lucas Valley is, could, could you carve an agreement with them for evening swim hours from Marinwood residents? or do something to, I mean, we have the customers that they, they have the pool, maybe that would be a partnership that would make sense. Yeah, I don't know, I mean, there are any issues with their pool, like Jeff was saying, so I don't know what the status of their pool is moving forward. Uh, but in the past, they've been very hesitant with opening up the pool to the public, I know. I know they've had programs, like right. a master's program and a year-round swim team. Right. Uh, but you know, they're not out there advertising comes from their pool. Okay, well, it's We have some sort of combined deal with Terra Linda? Not anymore. That was ah. back in the day. Oh, and then okay. How long has that not been happening? Uh, that was, that's it's stopped happening since like 2010 or 11. We stopped having oh, really? Okay. the joint membership. Oh, really? The option to buy a joint membership. I see. What, yeah. okay. what happened with that? They took over Hamilton. Oh, they didn't eat us. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right, any other discussion on pool rates? Okay, let's call a question. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Uh, the date of the next Park and Rec Commission meeting is January 23rd. Now we're moving. Oh, Eric. I had a comment on the uh, activity, recreation activity report. Uh, in the section, who read this stuff? Uh, the section under winter camps. It says that it, it went extremely well, and the gross revenue came out to 30000 something, slightly above last year's number. My concern is it would be, I think, much more informative if we had the net revenue, because we don't know what the we don't know what the expenses were. Right, and we'll have that. That camp just ended, so we weren't even finished finalizing payroll. Um, but we'll have that number for the next meeting. I don't think payroll yet. Before we do park and rec, I'd like to thank both you guys for your outstanding work this year. The camps are wonderful. The pool, I think, is terrific, and I enjoy it. I enjoy it. And thanks again. It's good job. Yay, everyone's favorite night of the year. So um, I um, 
Where is everybody and what do people want to do? I uh, was on the fire commission, I was the fire commission liaison, and uh, with the board's approval, I would love to be the LACO representative for next year, if that's okay with Earth, but if you'd like to maintain this, then by all means go ahead. I would like to, because okay. I can't afford any more Tuesday night meetings. I just like to say I think it should rotate occasionally rather than having the same old faces show up in the commission meetings. Uh, so they haven't ever gotten their act together the entire last year, oh, so I haven't. never had to go to a meeting. Oh, oh I see. <laughs> forgot to go to a meeting. Well, you know what? The Park and Rec commission meeting happens every month. I know that's the problem. I yeah. can I can also go to Park and Rec instead of fire. That just fire is not my thing. It seems. <laughs> Ron would disagree. Um, okay, so you're. So okay. who's parking rec right now? Jeff is. Hmm? I'm parking rec right now. Okay, you, yeah. thought you, you don't. You want five? It's not that I don't want to. I just think that this you, would you be have good. A, yeah, when well, you have the ESS. Yeah. Yeah, fire start. Okay, and you stay Lafco. Huh. Okay, so I'm on parking rec. Do we need to uh, do anything formal here? Yes. Uh, no, you just, you make appointments. You, you have that power as the right. board president, so you don't need to have a so motion or whatever. Wait, don't be something here. Yeah, and I think, you know, kind of to Isabella's point too, and much to Irv's point, there hasn't been a uh, heck of a lot going on with LAFCO in the past year. Um, I can give you a very brief update on where that stands in one second, but I also, uh, assuming they're both amenable to it, um, typically, for LAFCO and things that happen, it, they see me as their primary point of contact, just as they see department, you know, district heads at every district they work with as their primary. I get news from them. I pass it on to Irv. Sometimes it's news that impacts the district. Sometimes it, it isn't. Um, there is no reason why Isabella and I, I can't include Isabella on those communications. At the same time with Irv, it wouldn't be any sort of a Brown Act violation. I think if she's expressing interest in wanting to know more of what's going on with LAFCO, I would suggest uh, uh, two heads are better than one, personally. Uh, and also, it's, it's very possible that there will be a number of board members that will be interfacing with LAFCO this year because of the ESS mm -hmm. committee meetings. But speaking of LAFCO, weren't they going to do a survey? So here's what's going on with LAFCO. <laughs> I've actually uh, talked to, uh, within last week, as well as this week, I communicated with a woman named Rachel Jones, who is their interim executive officer. As I think you all know, Keen Simons left a few weeks ago, and ex or a few months ago, and accepted the position as the executive officer for LAFCO of San Diego County. Um, so he is gone. Rachel and I were actually scheduled to meet today. Unfortunately, she had car issues and wasn't able to uh, make it. We rescheduled for Friday, at which point uh, I'm planning on asking these same questions, what's going on with the municipal service review in light of these transitions, because right now they have an interim. Rachel had a job as an analyst there, so she's kind of doing both. I don't, uh, I want to know what their plans are for to fill that position on a permanent basis. How is this impacting the municipal service review, if at all? Will it be pushed back another year? Are they still anticipating completion? And also to bring her up to speed on some of the work that's happening with the ESS committee as well. Um, so I'll, uh, again, right now I'm scheduled to meet with her on Friday. It's informal. We're meeting over lunch um, just to kind of have an informal conversation, see how it's going, and I'll have a better sense of what is going on in LAFCO land uh, after that. Thanks. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, so, Leah, mm -hmm. I'm sorry, I didn't catch who you appointed to each of the three. Oh, you want me to go slowly? Let's see. Okay, so, excuse me. Um, park and Rec will be Isabella. Okay, thank you. And then Fire is going to be Bill. Ah. And then Lapco will be Earth. Thank you. And Isabella. Oh, and Isabella. Yes. Awesome. Can never have too much fun at Lapco. Uh, all right, so any other, oh, any comments on that? Uh, I forgot the name of it, the, the fire, uh, uh, fire group. Uh, yes, the G, no, the G, JPA. What, the phone? The Mira? Mira, that's it, uh, yeah. Are you gonna? The chief is um, our representative to Mira. Yeah, he's staff, I mean, are you? There, there wasn't an, an alternate or somebody 
They used to do that. It was me. Was he? Was he? Did you do? Oh, was there? Did you get to go to a meeting? Never. He never picked me up. You're just sitting on the porch waiting. I was waiting. So you're right. Yes, Mira. I know the chief is on the executive board for the Mira for Mira as well. Uh, at least he was. I'm not sure if he still is, uh, but he's a board member for Mira as well as. Uh, somebody on our side, so he's pretty well informed on what's going on there, yeah, but I do think Stephen's point, uh, probably something to think about, maybe get a little update from the chief prior to his uh, departure, and when that does happen, and take it from there. Um, actually, one of the points is, is that it's a, uh, it's, it's a political body, basically, um, and it should have political representation, not staff representation. So I would love it if one of you guys would, uh, I, mean, I don't want to exclude the chief, uh, and if he's got an executive position, and, but he's retiring soon, and so I urge one of you to step up to that position. Um, apparently we don't have a, we don't, we, we, we've uh, have a bond, but uh, they haven't purchased any radio equipment, so I would really like to know what's going on with Mira. Thank you. Uh, let's see. Request for future meeting agenda items. Two items. I don't know if they need to first be referred to staff and or Parks and Rec for one and Fire Commission for the other. But I eventually would like these items brought back to us. And one is the general issue of encroachments into our open space, specifically 2260 Las Colinas. Shane likes that one. And, and 258 Etta Court, which is really much more major encroachment. Uh, and there may be others that I'm unaware of. But I would like that investigated and reported back to us as to what's going on and what we're doing about it. What are the addresses? Can you repeat them, please? Uh, 2260 Las Colinas, mm -hmm. where a gentleman parks a huge camper and at least two other trailers and, and a little bit of yard material on our property. He's even put base rock so that the Winnebago doesn't slip into the, settle into the soil of our open space. And then at 258 at a court, that person has moved his fence out placed a large amount of fill, cut down trees, and has just at least one storage shed on our property. What street was that again? Etta 258 Court. Etta Court. Etta. Thank you. Whereabouts is sure. it? Is that up in your neighborhood? Or? No. You ought to know that. It's Etta. your neighborhood. Oh, no, I it's agree. off of, I can't remember the name of the street. It's off of. It's like right across from the middle school, right off of Boston Lane. Oh, OK. Yeah, it's like close to Ellen and like all the other yeah. 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 And yeah. Eric was trying to, to get the county to get interested in it, to, to do some enforcement. And I found out that the county planning staff is almost decimated. They're not getting anything done. Yeah, it was code enforcement. Yeah. I contacted on that part. They're not going to do He put up a retaining wall. He did all sorts of work that would require uh, permitting. The other item, the second item, and I, like I said, I, I mentioned these both at the last meeting, but some other weren't even in the minutes. Uh, I would like the fire staff and or commission or both to review our wildland policy to see if we can't allow residents adjacent to our open space to do more than just cut the weeds uh, within the 100 feet of their property line. I think they ought to, and it says they can cut mow weeds and, and remove small brush. I think they ought to be able to get rid of everything in that 100-foot strip aside from trees, and the trees ought to be limb. But I, I would like the commission and the staff to look at that. But I think we ought to be leading the charge there on making it easier for people to protect their property. Great. Thank you. Anybody else? I'll pass that on to the chief. Uh, might be able to make a commission agenda. Yeah, I, 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 uh, I understand what Irv said, and actually I agree with 
90 percent of it. Um, but please, 100 feet. Usually, it's 100 feet from from structures, not property lines. That's a huge amount of acres that you're talking about. But as far as the encroachments, I think. Um, I mean, this this happens. I mean, it, it happened right on Quietwood Drive. Um, I think there needs to be a staff member assigned to regularly patrol uh, our open, you know, our our property and uh, make note of encroachments and send people warnings and bills if necessary. I know when the county deals with these issues, they get serious with with legal action and um, I think we should do the same I mean it's it's our property these people have no right to uh, use it and uh, so it, but if we don't enforce it's going to be abused um, so I, I, I agree that that's an important issue uh, the other thing is more laws are being passed and we're likely to see more building close your ears but it's it's coming and it's going to be by right wing and it will change our communities drastically. All right, any other board member items of interest? Or no, no, sorry, requests for future meeting agenda items. Excuse me. Sorry, Linda. I, I do have a couple items okay. to add. Um, I'd like to see a written policy regarding communication from the district manager in a timely manner. And the other thing, um, Last month, I happened to talk to Frank Gobar, and I was asking him about the solar system and about reporting and financials and that kind of stuff. And he, he volunteered to come in and talk to the board and anybody around here, you know, anybody, anybody else who's here, about the reporting and the financials. And he explained to me that he does look at the reports. I remember Isabella saying we, that you guys don't need to run the reports even though they're available to run. You guys don't need to run them. Well, Frank explained to me why he runs the reports because he said he can tell from running the reports if there's a problem going on. And if he sees a problem, they want to be able to, Dan, Dan, Bill or Dan, yeah, whoever, Dan, Dan or whatever solar he's with, um, they want to fix the problem right away because the more efficient it runs, the more profit they get. So one of the things he said to me was he would love to volunteer to come in and talk 10, 15 minutes if, if you guys want him to. Anytime. What's the, what would be the purpose? I just said to go over the reporting. I know. The go over the reporting for what purpose? The purpose would be to... Since he's the one that's looking at the report for efficiency so they can earn more money, we're paying a set rate. I'm okay. trying to figure out why Well, we he care. also looks at old pg e reports. And remember, in the last few months, several of us have been asking the district manager how much money we could possibly be saving. And he has a little bit different way of looking at the old PGD numbers. And he was mentioning things about the PGE has raised prices. And you know, if you look at the old numbers and compare it to the new numbers, you can't really compare them. We can't because perhaps the district manager is not taking into account the uh, price increases. All I'm saying is people have asked how solar is going, and everybody says it's fine. We're saving money. I just brought it up because Frank Ogar offered to come in and talk to us to tell us how solar was going. If you guys are not interested, don't call them. That's all. Thank you. Uh, all right, anybody else? Item. I, recognitions and board member items of interest. I have one. Good. Um, so I will 
send an email to the board. Don't reply to it, so we're not doing any brown eye stuff. But um, on Thursday, January 25th, from 5 to 7 p.m., you are all invited to a ribbon cutting ceremony for my business that is moving into its new office in downtown San Rafael. The address is 889 4th Street. So there's a ribbon, ribbon cutting ceremony with the San Rafael Chamber of Commerce and We'll have a little reception and party upstairs with drinks and food for anybody who is so brave to come to such an event that just triggers my social anxiety like nothing else. But I am <laughs> inviting everybody because that is what I have been very occupied with for the last year and a half. So the project is... Uh, Congratulations. Thank you. Well, that'll be tomorrow when the building inspection uh, happens. Okay. <laughs> That's why my anxiety's been about up here for a while. But um, so anyway. you write your pizza or gas like that? Um, no, other yeah. side of the street. Other side of the street, where Rafael Forest is. Okay. So yeah, uh, uh, our my company's gonna be on the second floor there. Anybody else? They are allowed in the It should be an elevator, right? Yeah. <laughs> One story. My office manager is begging for an elevator because that's we've been trying to figure out how to carry all of our stuff up and down the stairs. It's been quite a uh, interesting experience. Oh, I get it. You're inviting us to help you move in, eh? Oh. Just <laughs> <laughs> well, your bring your pickup truck. I know. So avoid the irony there, huh? Exactly. The irony. <laughs> and, yeah, and it's funny because we're the business originally was in Fairfax, um, there was an elevator in that building and they used to do tests on it and run things. And so when I was a kid and I would go there, it was the, like the, it wasn't a functional passenger elevator, but it was a you know a working elevator. So freight elevator. Freight, freight elevator. elevator. Yes, there you go. So anyway. It was carried passengers. Yeah. Cool. And great. Good luck. Thanks. Congrats. Thank you. Any other recognitions, board member items of interest? Do I hear a motion to adjourn? So wait, wait, I just want to say one thing. I think I, I'm so pleased that you recognize Les Mims and uh, Roy Nishta. I think they got a kick out of it, and I think it was fantastic. And I want to recognize you guys for being good sports and doing that. It's fantastic. Did we hear the second one be adjourned? Yeah. Okay. All those in favor? One of the favorite. All those in favor, aye. Aye. All right, we'll see you February 13th.